Nobody wants to be ratioed. But this is a ratio you're happy to live with if you're a Dodgers fan. The greatest swing and miss ratio of his career. Clayton Kershaw's dominant game one. And anonymous players versus anonymous coach. Tim, it appears your Cowboys are suboptimal right now. Get to work, Tim. She's a mess. Meanest Cowboys, yes, they are. Okay, <laughs> okay. Mookie Betts up. Appreciation Day, the taco bringer. Clinton Yates, what did you call this? Exotic base running? Yes, I'm in favor of exotic base running. <laughs> That inning where the Dodgers stole three bases turned everything around. And Kershaw being so dominant, and how Kevin Cash managed Glass now in this game by order of the Peaky Blinders. He left him in that long. And Bellinger, whoa, what are you doing? Look at that celebration. Clinton, I'm gonna start with you around the horn to Mr. Yates. <laughs> what decided game one? To me, it was Mookie Betts. Remember back in July when the question we asked on this program was, is he worth the money, Mike Trout cash, for what he brings to the Dodgers? And I told y'all, the price be danged, because from a leadership standpoint, never mind it on the field standpoint, Mookie Betts gives you something that nobody else has. The pressure he's putting on teams on the base pass is a completely different thing than what he's doing from the grab standpoint in the outfield, never mind how he's hitting the ball. He's the difference, and the Dodgers believe that they can win with him. So you can say what you like about Kershaw, getting back on track. This is the reason you pay Marcus Lynn. He's an MVP guy who's got a ring. You saw that last night, and it wasn't just the stolen bases. That read on the on the on the ball going home where he went to first, that was an amazing play, and that's what you get out of bets. Tim Kalashaw, what decided game one? Well, I, as far as Mookie goes, it was the best World Series performance by a man wearing an oven mitt that I've ever seen. It, it was <laughs> fascinating what he was doing on the base pass. And I said, as long as we're going back to what we said at the time of this okay. uh, this trade that he can't do anything until the World Series because the Dodgers, they have enough talent to get there without him, without making that trade. So it is fitting that in the first game, he was as dominant uh, as, as he was. The, their lineup is loaded. Last year's MVP bats sixth, even with a right-handed power pitcher on the mound. That's what they do with Bellinger because they have so many guys they can put everywhere. But Betts... Uh, at the top of the order, he's really okay. The so now that we got a synopsis of what everybody said four months ago, did we forget <laughs> self promotion is the mating call of the mute button here? Let's go. Frank Isola, what you. decided game one of the World Series? You know, if you're scoring at home, it isn't the story that Clinton is always scoring at home. Bellinger gave them the lead with the home run. So, yes, Mookie Betts was a factor, but the game was over by then because they gave Clayton Kershaw a lead, and he pitches so much better. He was tremendous, and you're dealing with an undisciplined team at the plate. Tampa swings at everything, and most times they miss. They weren't good. Their starting pitcher wasn't good. This was all about Kershaw, who, after his last outing, we questioned him whether or not he could be a big-time pitcher in a big spot. He was last Nina night. Kime, game one, what decided it? Yeah, I'll split the middle. It was about Kershaw and Betts because there was that moment after Kershaw gave up the run, you know, between the top and the bottom of the fifth when every Dodgers fan in America felt that feeling, that dread in really? their stomach. And then Mookie Betts happened, right? He led the rally that gave Kershaw the run support he was missing in his last outing, and then Kershaw came in, closed, and dominated. It's Mookie Betts. He's the difference. He was the missing piece, the $365 million missing piece. And it's poetic to me that the last time Betts was in the World Series, he homered off of Kershaw. This time, he homered on his behalf. Yeah, yeah. He is the player who's, who can put the Dodgers over the edge and win Look them the World Clinton Series. there nodding his approval. Like, he was the one who invented the idea that Mookie Betts was no, good. No, I'm just <laughs> saying that you guys acted like it was some kind of a risk to take on the best player in the league. You're talking about Mike Trout. That guy doesn't even go to the playoffs. He watches him on his couch just like the I rest wish of I had Mookie Jackie McMullen or Bob Ryan or Michael Smith or somebody from Boston here so I can mute them oh. back to the Stone Age for trading away Mookie Betts. Man. Uh, Clinton, talk to me about Kershaw, though specifically do you think he could be on the other side of this now I think that at the very least, the mechanics are coming back and the slider's finally biting and he's getting out pitches with it. That's what's most important here. The, the story is one thing. And you can talk about how, you know, his postseason ERA is this, that, and the third. The mechanics are there. He's hitting his pitches and it's working. That's what's most important. I love when, when Clinton turns into a pitching coach. The mechanics are there. I mean, he talks with a pencil, so I guess, I guess he knows something about that. Mm -hmm. We'll move on. Ryan Fitzpatrick today. This is a story I want to get your take on. He was talking about the Dolphins' decision 
to bench him and start Tua. It still just it, it broke my heart yesterday, and I got basically got fired yesterday. And then my day of work today consisted of me in Zoom meetings listening to the guy that fired me, and then you know locked in a, a spaced out room, uh, you know, with my replacement for four hours today. Woo. Looking at your faces, looking at me to cons right now. I want to get this take. Yesterday's panel was all in favor of the move. I think because many thought Fitzpatrick was on board with it. Hearing him right there, Ryan Fitzpatrick, Mina Combs, what do you think? I'm shocked. Um, because when the move was announced, I was shocked. But I thought to myself, okay, if you're moving on from a quarterback who's playing as well as Ryan Fitzpatrick has been playing, like one of the top ten quarterbacks in the league, there has to be communication internally. Because you're selling this to the locker room, not just to Ryan Fitzpatrick. There has to be a premeditated plan that everybody's aware of and everybody's bought into. But that quote, that face makes me think that everybody wasn't on board and this wasn't communicated. And frankly, I'm really surprised coming from this organization. Frank Isola, how did you hear Ryan Fitzpatrick there? You know, did it come from somebody else besides the head coach? And because usually the coaches have a good relationship with all their players. You'd want that. You'd want to talk to all the players before it gets out in the news. But you know what? Just because maybe we look at Ryan Fitzpatrick as a caretaker doesn't mean that he looks at himself like that. He's been winning. He's played as well as any quarterback has the last few weeks. So from a competitive standpoint, why shouldn't he be disappointed? I think that's a very natural reaction that he has. Doesn't mean he's not in support of Tua. But I think he's allowed to uh, act like he that. He said after. he was heartbroken, Tim. He said he was on a four-hour call with the person who took his job. And he's wondering if this <laughs> is the last pass or the last time he'll start an NFL game. How did you hear Fitzpatrick? The same. I, it, it's stunning. If you saw him, uh, how excited he was for Tua to get into a game uh, as supportive as he was on that front, that when they made this move, as Mina said, you had to figure this was something that was understood. Ryan Fitzpatrick's. Uh, QBR. Do we like QBR? I think it was invented by this network. His QBR is better than Lamar Jackson. <laughs> better than Kyler Murray's. Are they, are they getting benched today? I don't think so. He feels like he's playing awfully well. Uh, not with the greatest supporting cast. Might have the best team in the East right now when you see how Buffalo's played. And he's getting benched. Uh, love to see a guy who just walked off a Jimmy Buffett concert set. Talk about QBR. Thank you, Tim. And how about you, Clint I Yates? I don't know the Buffett reference. Yeah. <laughs> But when I, when I watch those comments, Tony, there's a lot of spicy mustard on that hot dog. It's one thing to bring up the fact that you're talking to a guy who fired you. It's another thing to talk about the specific blocking in the room of where you are and who you've got to look at because you are hurt and heartbroken. I know this feeling. This is the feeling you get when you realize that you will always be the side piece and you will never be the main. He is heartbroken for a reason because people know who he is. Uh, well, I mean, it's not mutually exclusive, right? A guy could be a good teammate and a good caretaker, but also be fiercely, you know, uh, competitive and want the job. Mina, let me ask it to you this way. Do you, does this change the way you view Tua starting now? I think it puts a ton of pressure on Tua, right? Because Ryan Fitzpatrick had been playing so well, and now we know he wasn't happy with how it went down. Then Tua has to come in against the Rams and outperform him. It's not the right expectation. I'm saying, you know, he's a rookie, but that's the expectation a lot of people are going to put on him. And I'll say one more thing about Fitzpatrick, him talking about having played his last game. I sense a little whiff of maybe trade me in there because there are some teams that could use him. Could one of those teams be the Dallas Cowboys by chance, Mita Kimes? Or Segway. <laughs> the anonymous cowboy player course. I want to talk about this next because this is a great job reporting from Jane Slater of the NFL Network. Here's what she got. Quote, totally unprepared. Quote, they don't teach. Quote, they don't have any sense of adjusting on the fly. Quote, they just aren't good at their jobs. End quote. So in Mike McCarthy's media availability, Slater asked the coach about it, and he addressed it publicly. Quote, I think the key word is anonymous. He also said, quote, it's important to handle things as, as men. I mean, if you do have something to say publicly that is most important, I think it's most important to say it to the individual, particularly in a group dynamic setting. So, Mina, how do you hear the players, and how do you hear McCarthy? Uh, the players sound embarrassed, and they should be, based on what we saw in the last game. This feels a little bit like passing the buck. And I want to be clear, I'm not absol absolving the coaches of blame. Uh, when I watch 
the Dallas Cowboys. I see a team that's undisciplined, ill-prepared. They come out flat, especially on defense. You see there's a lot of confusion back there. That does fall on the coaches. But equal blame falls on the players and Jerry Jones, who put this roster together. Like, there's no one in Dallas who is clean of all of the, the blame that should be attributed to this organization right now. Tim Kalisher, I believe this is your account now. Uh, the idea that they're anonymous players and that reports cite anonymous players. And the, and the idea that Mike McCarthy maybe isn't teaching well at this moment. Well, I, I have problems with this, but not because of the inaccuracy of the quotes. I think anybody watching their games, any Cowboys fans watching it, probably feels that way, that the coaches look like this. You watch the Monday night game, and, uh, and Lewis Riddick, I think, was saying, this Cowboys defense is so easily outflanked. I love that reference. They're just, they're just out of position in a heartbeat. Uh, all the time, and that's why they've given up the most points in the league. All that's true, but when you're playing this poorly as players and you're talking anonymously, saying, yeah, put it on the coaches. It's not us. They're not teaching us what to do. Well, a lot of it's on you. You're the player. Right, guys, Sola? You know, I don't think it's tough to find in a locker room disgruntled employees, especially employees on a team that are 2-4 and four and haven't played well. To Tim's point, the quarterback they last faced completed nine passes, and they put up 38 points on the Cowboys. So, to me, this is on the players. If this story comes out in December, that's one thing. I mean, the head coach does have a track record. He's coached in a lot of playoff games. He's won a Super Bowl. Who are these anonymous players out there? Put your name on it. Let's put you up to the microscope and see how you perform. Let me ask you this then, Frank. You're a reporter. Would you cite an anonymous source there? Would you demand that they have to source their work? In, in the full context of a story, I certainly would. And to Tim's point, you when certainly you would watch what? them Excuse play, me, they sorry, look I, I like that. that. You, would you allow for an anonymous source in this story? It, it depends on how I, I fit it into the story. But again, especially in a football locker room, it's easy to find disgruntled workers who maybe aren't playing a lot or upset. It's not that hard to do, honestly. Yates. You could do an NBA locker room just about every day. Goal? Yeah, I don't think the journalism is the issue here, but I think your point is correct. If guys are willing to come up and say it, but they're not willing to put their name behind it, it feels a little different. However, let's not forget how McCarthy got here. Hadn't been coaching in the league for a while, was just wandering the desert, dropping in on different people, has a sleepover with the owner. Next thing you know, he pops up as the coach. We're talking about one of the most arrogant franchises in the league. I can completely understand why when they're in their position at first in, you know, first in the division and they suck, the people are like, nah, not buying this guy's stuff. It makes complete sense to me. I know it isn't. Um... QBR, a stat of that nature for you, Tim Kalashaw, that DVOA. But do you know this defense right now? It is the worst defense do I know in it? 59 years in the NFL. That's what they are at points Ooh, scored, that very, very simple metric, points scored. Coming up, all kinds could of Trevor that. Lawrence say no to the New York Jets? And could Frank Isola say no to that story and by herself? <laughs> <laughs> NBA coaching hire this afternoon. It's the New Orleans Pelicans and it's Stan Van Gundy. Frank Isola, first to you. Buy or sell this hire. You know, he's 140 games over 500 for his career. He's been to three conference finals, one NBA finals. His last stop in Detroit was not great, but I think he is a good coach. I think he obviously increased his profile by being on TV, being very outspoken. He's coached J.J. Redick. I think J.J. Redick probably put in a pretty good word for him, gave him the blessing. Okay, but they're not hiring. Well, I mean, they are hiring him to coach J.J. Redick, but they're hiring to coach Zion Williamson. How do you think that affects Zion? Dwight Howard's best years with Stan Van Gundy. Why can't the same thing be true of Zion Williamson? Mm -hmm. Tim Kalashaw, by herself. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to buy it, too. The coaching record tells you that he is the kind of guy who will take a team that's not very good and at least get him up into the playoffs, which is what New Orleans is facing, and that's a daunting challenge in the West. So there's a lot of work to be right. successful just to get to be a 6-7-8 seed. Clinton Yates, Stan Van Gundy is the choice to coach Zion and the Pelicans by herself. I don't, I don't mind it. It adds to the general business of show of what is the Pelicans. We all love Stan Van Gundy. Didn't expect him to be the first Van Gundy off the board, by the way, in terms of coaching. But overall, I mean, I think this is going to be good for him. We've seen what he does with young players for sure. Mita Kimes. Uh, I'm buying it because one thing we know from listening to Stan as an analyst and calling games, he's been frustrated with the Pelicans' lack of defense. So I expect <laughs> him to work very hard on fixing that. I am selling that he's probably going to tweet less, which is disappointing because I love his Twitter. He is aggressive on Twitter. He is. He'll take that aggression to the Pelicans' locker room. We'll move on. Buy or sell two. <laughs> love this story. Are the Jets bad enough, cursed enough, 
unsophisticated, rudderless, and directionless enough to motivate Trevor Lawrence to pull an Eli Manning and circumnavigate them all together. That's what Connor Orr, Sports Illustrated, wrote. Frank, I go to you for the Jets and for rudderless, directionless, N- unsophisticated. <laughs> Should Trevor Lawrence no, be trying to I don't avoid think he's <laughs> Come on, if Trevor Lawrence is going to be number one and the Jets have the number one overall pick, that means that the whole regime will be changed over. And need I remind you, it wasn't that long ago that the Jets made it to back-to-back conference championship games, so they're not a total mess over the last two. Wait, how long ago was it that they made it to back-to-back yeah, conference championship? It's mo- Ask Mark Sanchez. Yeah, it's He's more than a decade at this point. <laughs> Tim Kalish, how about you? I'll remind some of the panel who may not remember. There was a time a prominent quarterback passed on the St. Louis Cardinals to sign with the Jets named Joe Namath. It worked pretty well then. Now, this might be a different era, but that doesn't mean it can't work again for Trevor Lawrence. Clint Yates. Trevor Lawrence, better hair, better looking guy than Joe Namath, but overall the math doesn't even add up here. Like 10 teams in the league, a third of the league has one win or fewer. It might not even be the Jets who get the number one pick. Right, I guess this could apply to Jacksonville. It could apply to New York Giants. It could apply to about six programs, but Mina Kimes, the New York Jets, have they reached a state where if you're Trevor Lawrence or the any other top pick, you're like, get me away from here? No, because as Frank said, if they have the number one pick, Adam Gase is going to be the coach. Trevor will know who the coach is, whether it's the Eric Bieniemy or an Arthur Smith, and he can, you know, identify whether it's an advantageous situation. And they'll have a ton of draft picks and cap space. They'll be in a good spot. One more story here: buy or sell three. I don't think I've slipped. The situation's the game where you have to throw in certain windows with guys putting their arms up trying to slap the ball, and that's why he changed his delivery. He said, "Who is it?" It's Lamar Jackson with those side arms and the ball dropping, the elbow dropping, and the numbers dropping this year. Clinton, buy or sell Lamar's self-critique? Uh, I'm buying it. I mean, the thing about this is that I don't necessarily worry about the numbers. I worry about the decision-making when his arm slot changes. When he drops down, it means he's rushing himself, and I don't love that overall from a quarterback. It's different from Mahomes in that regard. Mina Kimes? I'm selling that it's just about mechanics. It's a lot of things. And it's not just Lamar Jackson who has struggled throwing the ball downfield. It's the pass protection, the lack of weapons. I think Baltimore should trade for someone. The whole passing Ooh. game needs to Ooh, I love this. Spot. All right, I've been putting this out here for a couple days. Nobody's bought. Do you buy this, Mita Kimes? The Dallas Cowboys trading any of their receivers, honestly, but Amari Cooper to oh, Baltimore. Good. Michael Gallup to Baltimore. Are you with me? I mean, I'm with it from a Baltimore standpoint, but Dallas isn't trading any of them. They're not? No way. Uh-huh. I'd be shocked. Wouldn't they want to you know, blow it up a little bit, shed some salary? Frank, I sold. I'll bring you in here. <laughs> yeah, you sound like the anonymous player. You want to give up on the Cowboys season. As for Lamar Jackson, listen, <laughs> he's not Dan Marino. We get that. But I still believe that you could win with him. We knew coming out of college, accuracy was a problem. He needs to get better, and I think Tim Callis show. I'm buying that he, he's aware that he does have shortcomings. He doesn't, he doesn't want to hear that he's not a quarterback, nor should he have ever heard that. But he is willing to work on some things, and, uh, you know, he, he may not have a season like last year. That was pretty magical. I go to Tim Kalifshaw for being aware of shortcomings. This is, this is fun for me because Tim does not have return video, as we say, return vid in the business. So he doesn't know what his TV score is right now. Tim, you want to take a guess what the score is right here? Are you advancing or are you going 27. home? 27. 27. Oh, okay. Whoa. Oh, all right, not bad. Wow. Gates is at 27. You're at 25. Times I solo going away right here. But Kalifshaw, you made it into the showdown. Maybe you should have no return video every day. Showdown, two minutes. Clint, Timmy. Here's the story for showdown. Washington football team likely staying the Washington football team another year, says the president of the Washington football team. Tim, this is a great story for you because you didn't name Rachel or Ben until they were two. So do you need two seasons to come up with a name? No need to rush into these things, but I do have an answer. Joe Theismann said on my radio show, call them the generals. Everybody will make fun of it. But when they're good, it'll be a great name. Whatever the name is, it doesn't matter that they can't move on because the larger problem here is, as evidenced by not being able to change the colors, they can't move on from the past. That's why the president and future are doomed. See? Wow. That is, that is enormous. That it's just, and it's, wow. Clinton Yates, point. We'll move on. Rob Manfred saying he wants to keep expanded playoffs. Maybe not 16 teams like this year, but more than 10 last year. And he also wants to keep the extra inning rule. Runners starting at second base for the regular season. Clinton, does that work for you? 
I don't mind it. The move here is to keep the three-game series for the wild card. But the extra inning thing was cool, not because it saved time, but because it made games better. But what you have to drop is the three-inning maximum – sorry, minimum four playoffs for pitchers. I'm encouraged by the fact he acknowledged it's not going to be 16 teams. That's what you got to get away from. you got to reward yeah. the top teams yeah. in a long season. The seven-inning gimmick – I mean, the, the uh, gimmick on second hits him. Tim, you probably didn't notice it, but you just took a few points in to win the FaceTime today. 30 seconds, Mr. Kalashoff. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, Mike Doc Emmerich is retiring. Nobody was ever better at his job than the beloved hockey announcer. Uh, the period of the long change, it sounded like the Bataan Death March. Uh, a shift change sounded like revolution <laughs> was taking place. He, 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 made a, he made a bad game or a dull game sound good, and a good game sound like something you could not afford to miss. If he was doing this right now, he would say, there are zero and a quarter minutes left in this FaceTime, and then it's going to be on to the next show, so let's keep watching. Don't <laughs> anybody go anywhere. Mike Emmerich was great, and uh, we're all going to miss him in the NHL. Love it. Thank you, Tim. That's going to do it, folks. 23 and a half hour break.